people have always migrated and travelled the world. The stories and the way that they change the cultures they go to, the way the cultures actually respond to their arrival are absolutely fascinating. And that's where social and cultural approaches to migration are really important. This was a project about experiences and feedback around the use of interpreters in healthcare settings and really concerns about the quality of interpreting, about the experiences of interpreters, about the experiences of healthcare practitioners and the experiences of service users. This is a project about health. Your body is involved in health. Um, it's not a set of numbers that are ab abstracted and that are on a bar graph or a pie chart. It's actually about how you are feeling pain or how you are experiencing symptoms and then your ability to communicate those which is always hampered a little if you're not feeling very well. I'm sorry, I don't know what you're saying. Habla español. Me duele el brazo. I'm sorry. It's sought to engage with migrants who've arrived um, quite recently in the city, asylum seekers and refugees, with people who are interpreting professionals and uh, people who manage interpreting services. It's also sought then to engage with primary healthcare practitioners, so GPs, midwives, people working, for example, at the Sandiford Clinic in sexual health, people working in community health centres. So those have been the kind of three groups of people that we've really been seeking to engage. Well, this project set out to achieve a number of goals, really, but ultimately was to produce educational material and learning material that was grounded in the realities of practice that reflected the realities of practice around challenges of intercultural communication. And that's where we went to the forms which for me exemplify that and are best suited to that, which are film and drama. Because in film and drama, your body's right centre stage and you are actually able to experience emotion and, and feeling and response that you wouldn't otherwise feel um, when you saw a bar chart or a graph or a set of percentages and statistics. At which point we then started to work with our production company, um, Showman Media, to devise um, a set of narratives and to translate what is focus group data, interview data, which is quite dry and transcribed, into something that could look as though it could actually act on a stage and be inhabited uh, by human beings telling human stories. Pakistan, what are you doing? I'm not sure. Glasgow is an incredibly exciting and vibrant city and has always been marked by migration and immigration. And yet, um, since about 2000, when there was a policy of dispersal of asylum seekers, by the Westminster government. Glasgow has taken a very large number of asylum seekers and has, after a slightly shaky start, had really quite an extraordinary track record of integration. Um, integration from day one is the policy of the Scottish government. What you hear on the streets isn't quite the same as what you used to hear. Glasgow sounds different. That has brought some challenges, but also some real opportunities. And um, for me, I think what's important is that we learn to think with the issues the city brings to us as a civic university at the University of Glasgow, which has been leading on this project. So the universities involved are Glasgow University and Glasgow Caledonian University. Well, it's a Gramnet project, largely, and it's funded by the AHRC, which is the Arts and Humanities Research Council, and the Scottish Funding Council as well, under a Healthier Scotland programme. BEMIS, which is the Black and Ethnic Minority Infrastructure of Scotland, they are our known academic partner um, and we also receive some funding from the British Council. I think BEMIS has been one of the key organisations who um, try to break this barrier and work with the academics and bringing them uh, very close to the voluntary sector as well and because we would like them to experience uh, uh, the role of the communities on the ground um, what are the barriers for them. You can, uh, they have the expertise, but we have the membership and the infrastructure on the ground. You know, I don't see why I couldn't interpret for my daughter-in-law. Seems an awful waste of taxpayers' money to have booked an interpreter. It's just standard procedure. So we didn't want to say, this is how you do it. This is a code of practice, this is a leaflet that will tell you how you're supposed to interpret or behave as a patient or behave as a healthcare practitioner. But it was rather to put it all in the round for the first time. 
to show the drama, the accident, the problem, the things that go wrong, the assumptions, the loneliness, the pressure on interpreters, the time, the fact that being able to speak your language for the first time to an interpreter after nine months in a country is a moment of real tenderness. And then the tragedy of that interpreter saying, I'm sorry, I'm not here to speak in this language, I'm here to speak in another language. People who weren't taking drugs because the way in which they were being communicated with from primary healthcare providers didn't fit with their cultural context and their cultural understanding. Interpreters being put under pressure to um, behave in certain ways in people's homes, which was against their code of ethics and their code of practice. Especially when sometimes they used to their own families, especially when they're trying to register with the doctor and the diagnosis of their illness isn't prevailed uh, correctly or understood correctly by the doctor. And the anxiety that comes with people who are needing help care and often it's crisis situations it's really nice if it's not but often it is crisis situations and so all that puts a pressure on um, what happens in a consultation or in a community setting or at home and um, I think the project has allowed us to look at that and what people do with it and how skilled people who work in that area have become uh, uh, and so this project is both a learning tool but it actually also is a celebration. Those really poignant moments that are right at the heart of arts and humanities work are incredibly powerful tools for actually educating and teaching people. This training model is absolutely one that can be adapted to a range of settings and we've already seen that because part of our dissemination event for the project was to invite quite a targeted audience, community development, people who work with people who use interpreters very broadly, very generally, and they could immediately see the benefit of this as a community engagement tool, whether it's around equalities, whether it's around community development, whether it's around adult education, whether it's around social work. And so, although the focus of this project has been about health, the key questions that we're trying to address are universal when it comes to intercultural communication and about social interaction and doing this in a way that's as ethical and as respectful and focused on building trusting relationships as possible. This is a project that contributes directly to a healthier Scotland in that it is about promoting equality of access to services. Migration is something that affects the whole of Scotland and in order to improve the quality of access to healthcare and ultimately healthcare outcomes, what we need is the best possible communication when it's needed. And what this project will do is start to raise those questions for practitioners to reflect on their practice, for interpreters to reflect on their practice, and service users to get a better understanding of what to expect. And I think if those things start to happen, there is an immediate benefit to the overall health of Scotland in the immediate, but also in the long term.